Following the Nevada hearing on the Khabib Nurmagomedov versus Conor McGregor post-fight brawl, I put up a video, and at the end of it, I talked a lot about uh, comments made by Anthony Marnell about policing fighter speech in the future in the lead-up to fights. And afterwards, um, Chuck Mendenhall of MMA Fighting put up a, a, I guess, a blog, you could call it, or an article just talking about how he, he agreed that it was unsettling that they would even think about doing it in the first place. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the actual clip of the chairman talking about this and then um, give my reactions on it a little bit further and just kind of have that in a standalone video. Discuss mouthy fighters and the things that they say prior to fights and what the consequences are for that. The promoters are going to have to start taking some ownership for this um, and, and, and putting uh, fighters in a little bit more of a box on how far we can go with this because we don't need this. It's the first time I've ever been called from the industry that said, don't ever bring that back here. And that usually doesn't happen in Las Vegas Bowl. The verbal lead up to, you know, the exodus from the cage, you know, all the things that happened on the concourse that night at T-Mobile. A lot of people ran out of there not happy, afraid, not, you know, scared, not coming back. And so it's got to be good for everybody. You know, I'm a big fan of all the arrows pointing in the same direction. And if it's just good for the UFC, and it's not good for the T-Mobile, it's not good for Las Vegas, it's not good for this town. All the safety measures have already been addressed, and you'll see a substantially different octagon at the next UFC fight in Las Vegas. That was addressed within a week after that fight. Um, you're going to see Metro presence like you've never seen around that octagon. No different than just a boxing. So security-wise, it's been addressed. But verbal, verbal antagonization to lead up to those events has got to get itself put back in check. You know, we can't we can't cross lines into families and, and, and race and... It's just not, it's not, it's not what the sport's about. But then what you do take a first amendment challenge to that, being the government? <laughs> I haven't thought that far. It's not sportsmanlike conduct. Yeah. I just want to pause right there. I'll get to the end. But the fact that he would be asked if he thought about the first amendment, he laughs and says, I haven't thought that far is absolutely ridiculous. You've had over four months to get ready for this meeting. You've thought about this idea of policing fighter speech up until then. And you haven't thought about the first amendment that hasn't come to your mind. That makes literally, it just doesn't make any sense at all, but um, I'll let him continue and I'll let Bob Edden, um jump in as well. Yeah, I guess you can say whatever you want at any time, but that doesn't mean that you should earn a privileged license. You know, and I think that's the uh, people have to understand that this license is a license of privilege, not a license of right. And so I'll leave that up to a bunch of attorneys to fight it out. But I think most people would subscribe to let's tone it down a little bit. Yeah, so that's it right there. But I think for the most part, most MMA fans who've heard this think it's absolutely ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense at all to try to police speech. They don't think that even if they did it, that there'd be any uh, legal recourse for them. Now, he did mention the um, the concept of a fighter license being a, a matter of privilege and not a right. Therefore, that would give them the freedom to do it. Uh, I feel like that probably gets into some dicey territory. I'm not a lawyer. I don't have a law degree, so it's not like I'd be able to really dig too deep into that. But I feel like there's still a good challenge that could be made against that claim even even if that's what it is. Because if you start arguing that fight licenses are licenses of privilege, then in theory that means they could just kind of willy-nilly decide who to license and who not to, uh, just for j just based off of no good standards at all. So hopefully we don't get to a point where this actually gets challenged, but the fact that they still felt comfortable talking about this in the meeting after having so much time to prepare for it, the fact that they weren't even ready to answer a question on the First Amendment being an issue with it, it, it it's a terrible sign. I'm glad that most fans don't agree with it. Um, but surprisingly, there's more than I expected that do. So when I just went down through the comment section here, uh, now granted the way that the comments work on MMA fighting is it goes chronologically. It's not, um, based off of top comments in terms of popularity, but the first one that came was, I just agree with you here. I'm sure we all talking, talking and nobody's saying we want fighters to be PG-13 at press conferences. We all love the drama and taking the piss out of somebody can be entertaining and hilarious. Uh, talking about Bisping and Rockhold. Uh, however, this behavior, which you even described as dark, was what was beyond acceptable or should be accepted by society. Do believe fighters need censoring? No. Do I think most people um, keep the animosity with, with what we have in combat athletes? Um, but do I think there's a line that you cross that somebody should say enough is enough? Absolutely. Is that the responsibility of the commissions of the UFC? I don't know. Uh, so first off, I'll kind of answer that and say, yes, it is the responsibility of the UFC. They're the, they're the actual company. They're not the government. And in the past, they have decided to jump in on these types of situations. So, um, yeah, this article pop back up. So here are a few examples of when the UFC actually did jump in off of situations where they didn't like what fighters were either talking about in their own free time or in the lead up to fights. So Miguel Torres, um, tweeted out, um, this old, uh, tweet that got him fired from the UFC back in 2011, which was basically just like an old, um, recycled joke about, um, rape fans. Uh, let me see what he said. So it says, if a rape van was called a surprise van, more women wouldn't mind going in for rides in them. 
So it was just kind of an unoriginal joke that he tweeted out. He got fired for it. So there, the UFC, not the commission, decided to take action on it. Uh, another example that we had was with Matt Metrione, uh back when Fallon Fox was a bigger story. Now, on, in some areas, Fallon Fox is still a story. I'm not sure why I'm going to talk about it for a while. But um, he made a, a few comments pretty much saying that Fallon Fox was a man, that this is a man beating up women. Uh, the UFC decided to sus- suspend him, uh, saying that what he was saying was transphobic, uh, whether you agree with him or not, or whether you agree with the UFC making that decision or not. Again, there they are stepping in. And then another example was with Josh Thompson. Now, in this case, there wasn't actually um, any punishment. It was just more of like a severe tongue lashing. But Josh Thompson on Twitter um, basically threw up the idea of saying, hey, look, the logic that a lot of people are using uh, in, in these pro-gay marriage arguments are, quote, love is love. If it doesn't affect you, why why would you be annoyed by it or why would you try to stop it? And he was saying, well, if you use the logic of love is love, if it doesn't affect you, you could also say, for pedophilia, well, love is love. It's those two. Why does it not affect you? Which isn't a great argument because pedophilia is a separate issue because you're dealing with minor. But he also incest, for example, if you have two adults, love is love. It doesn't affect you. So he's just saying if that's the logic you're using, then here's where else it, where else it could be applied. And Dana White um, said that that argument was the dumbest thing he's ever heard. But since he didn't specifically call anyone out, um, they weren't going to suspend him. But again, they, they kind of reprimanded him there for that. So the UFC – oh, and one more um, – Nate Diaz, um, after, so Pat Healy was scheduled to make $130,000 in bonus money after a fight, I believe it was a million dollar, dollar. Uh, but he, he was supposed to get a uh, performance in the night, fight of the night, or a, I think it was a submission of the night, but he had $130,000 in bonuses that were headed his way, and he ends up testing positive for marijuana, and because of that, all that money was taken away, and the UFC gave some of that money to Brian Caraway, who was also on the same card. And Caraway, instead of just giving the money back to Healy and saying, hey, this is stupid. Why are you losing this money over a pot? Uh, Caraway just took it. So Nate Diaz decided to call him the biggest fag in the world. Uh, so he also got suspended for that. So again, another example of the UFC deciding to take this into their own hands, which is their prerogative, whether you think that they may have crossed the line in some cases or not. Um, but, but they're the ones responsible for it, not the government, not the commission. So going back to the comment here, um, is that the responsibility of the commissions of UFC? It's the responsibility of the UFC. But one of the other things that bothered me about what Marinella was saying is that he didn't like that Connor was talking about family and that he was talking about religion. And in theory, if he is going to make laws about what fighters can say, you kind of have to be pretty um, pretty clear on what that is. And if it's going to be talking about family or talking about religion, first off, as far as religion goes, the only comment that Connor made that I think was even remotely related to religion was when he he who is freshly announcing his proper 12 whiskey uh, offered a, a cup or a glass to Khabib Magomedov. Now Khabib's a known Muslim and Muslims don't drink alcohol, or at least those who um, follow strictly don't drink alcohol. So the idea there was by offering alcohol to a Muslim, like, like a big thing of uh, Orthodox Jew or something to that effect. And so that was crossing the line. Now that's kind of up for interpretation in theory, just offering somebody a drink or offering a, a drink that you own the company of, on its own, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just more the the context that he's Muslim, so therefore he must have known, and in all likelihood he did know. But then you're, you're kind of getting an interpretation because the act itself of offering whiskey isn't all that bad, but it's more so who you're offering it to and if you knew um, how religious they were. But then the part about family that kind of bugs me is that from what I recall from Connor's press conference, the family that he was referring to was Khabib's dad, um, his brother, and some of his cousins. Now, what's notable about this is Khabib's dad is a coach, Khabib's brother is a fighter. Um, he was referring to Khabib's brother getting knocked out in the World Series of Fighting or PFL. I don't remember which one it was at the time. And then um, his cousins, obviously, are fighters, too. So it's not that he was talking about someone in Khabib's family who has no relation to him, whether as a coach or a training partner. He was talking about people who are related, but also coaches and training partners. So is it crossing the line if you're talking about someone's family, if the family is also involved in the business of fighting? That I don't know. I don't actually buy that. In theory, if we're just going to kind of make something up, let's say that I was fighting Sergio Pettis and I wanted to make an argument that Sergio's fighting style wasn't all that useful anymore. And I said, hey, look at Anthony. He used to be the top lightweight, but now he's not doing anything at lightweight. That's because the Pettis style doesn't work. In theory, I would be talking about his family because I'd be talking about Pettis. Pettis, 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 I'd be going even far from bringing up family. I don't think that is. Um, But based off of what they're talking about, that potentially could be considered crossing the line because I'd be talking about family. So all in all, let people keep saying what they want to say. Let free speech stand and 
let's have fun with this out here.